Welcome to Force Perspective. Uh, nice mustache. Today we'll be taking a look at Underhero, a game where you play as a silent protagonist venturing into a strange land inhabited by monstrous beings. But as you continue on with your quest, you get the sense that maybe the people here aren't the evil monsters that they seem. Just victims of circumstance forced to do what they think is necessary in order to survive. And in that way, it's a lot like Undertale. Huh. Okay, it might just be the name. A masked kid, one of the closest and most loyal of Lord Stitch's minions, succeeds in single-handedly vanquishing the hero. And with minimal collateral damage. But upon further investigation, he finds that the hero's sword is still intact and very chatty, telling him to take up the heroic task of the previous and now very dead hero by robbing and murdering his co workers, which. Yeah, okay. Underhero is a 2D side-scrolling action RPG platformer, which doesn't roll off the tongue very well, but in practice it does all work. I think the best way to actually describe it is with the developer's own declaration that it was inspired by the Paper Mario series, as it does play similarly in a lot of ways, traveling through unique worlds, solving problems, and dealing with enemies in RPG combat. Except Underhero is played entirely on a 2D plane and its combat is actually closer to the Mario and Luigi games and even then it's not in turn but you know what let's just get into the platforming which this being an RPG you might not think platforming is a huge part of it but it's a side-scrolling RPG so you know and overall the platforming is good it's not very complex or challenging failing a jump doesn't kill you it just takes away some health and sends you back to the previous platform Plus, the hoodie shoot allows you to correct any messed up jump, so you're pretty safe. And while I personally would have liked a bit more challenge, the controls are responsive and the jumping feels good, it's well weighted, so there's not many things to complain about. Not none, though. Alright, here's the thing. Initially, it seemed like the way they were going to deal with the problem of distinguishing the background objects in the play area was... by not. But, but in a good way, by making it so everything that could be a platform, was a platform. Even if it wouldn't come up in any practical sense, and I was going to praise that, but then this isn't a platform. But this is. But this isn't. It's really strange. Not bad, per se? Just weird. And another nitpick I have, which is all these really are, is the water sections. And yes, I mean sections. There's not just one water level. There are several water sections. And a full water level. And here's my unpopular opinion. I don't normally dislike water levels. Sure, they're slow and kind of played out at this point, but I'm fine with them. Normally. And it's difficult to put my finger on what I don't like here, but I think my main problem with these underwater segments is that they're segmented out. Instead of being able to buckle in for one differently paced level, you keep transitioning in and out of these obnoxiously slow water parts. You can't plan for it. You just have to deal with it. And I don't like that. I really don't like that. But it is what it is. And it's not like there's water everywhere. Just sort of feels like it. And to their credit, they made these sonic spin dash vortex things to help you get through the water maze faster. Water maze. I, I don't know what to feel. Well, at the very least, it's a nice example of the way they vary up the platforming. Meaning that the platforming options don't change throughout the game. You don't unlock different mobility abilities. No double jumps or wall jumps or... Yeah, any other jumps, you get to one. And it's good enough. The changing of level design and scenery throughout the worlds combined with the few little diversions like the water vortex things are enough to keep things from getting stale. 
they are more than the sum of their parts, and make the platforming consistently entertaining. Although, in retrospect, maybe the water maze wasn't the nicest of examples. But it was the most... prevalent. I think it still counts. And with that done, we get to what makes up the rest of the game's bulk, the combat, which has a lot going for it. Under here's combat system is really interesting. The way it works is once you come in contact with an enemy in the world, you transition pretty seamlessly into a battle screen where you have a constantly replenishing amount of stamina that can be used to do different attacks. You can do a quick and effective sword slash, a slow and stamina intensive but highly damaging hammer strike, or bring out a slingshot for precisely aimed long range but less damaging shots. And all of that is fine and dandy, but what I enjoy the most is how you deal with your enemy's attacks. Each enemy type has a small set of attacks that each have a different little telegraph, and you can avoid those attacks by reading these telegraphs and either jumping or ducking at the right time, depending on which attack it is. In addition, you can also use your shield to block most attacks at the cost of its durability, eventually causing it to break. But even then, if you use the shield at the exact moment an attack hits, you will parry, causing a stun for your enemy and no durability loss. And having that control over the damage you take, well, I can't say it adds an immense amount of depth or anything, it does make what could have very easily just been the standard turn-based fare much more engaging and enjoyable. The only thing I will say against the combat is that near the end of each world, fighting some of the enemies just becomes busy work. You fought them so many times that there isn't anything to it anymore. Some added varieties of enemies, or even spacing out the more common, already existing enemies out more, I think would have added a lot. But even then, you can avoid the fights by bribing them. See, I checked. A bit ago. I didn't know what I'm about. Also, you don't get as much XP when you bribe them, and the level up options are just really enticing. Okay, they're actually pretty lackluster. Health, stamina, or damage, but I gotta get something out of this. Plus, I can use that gold that I didn't use to bribe those people that's sparing their lives, and purchase upgrades that are slightly more interesting. Well, three of them are more interesting when you have their two identical counterparts that you have to find or earn elsewhere. These three are pretty cool when you have all nine of them. Let's just move on to the bosses, which, oh boy, this is going to be fun. Unironically, the boss fights in this are fantastic. Instead of just being locked into a combat screen once you come in contact with the boss, most of the fight is done in an action platforming style, where you learn patterns and move around to avoid attacks. Then, once the boss is in a vulnerable state, you can walk up and it transitions into the battle screen where you can deal your damage. It combines what you would expect in a boss fight from both its RPG and action platformer side, and it does it so smoothly. Plus, each boss is so unique, dramatically different from the others, and I even love all. Most of their music. The boss fights really are a big part of what makes Underhero shine. Even the mini bosses are good. I love it. And the best part is, the bosses are packaged with the rest of a high quality game. Sure, it has problems, I have my nitpicks, but overall, this is the type of game you don't see that often, and it's executed really well. The gameplay's good, the story's fun, the art style is charming, and even the dialogue which I was a little iffy on at first. It's written in a self horror style that I've seen done badly enough to be kind of hesitant towards, but it grew on me. By the end of the game, any trepidation I had was gone. This is a great game. Although, I will say, I could see how the dialogue-heavy style could potentially cause someone to go through a section of the game a long way in order to get one of those wonderful upgrades I mentioned, only find out if complete that section of wandering around for 15 minutes, and they didn't trigger the needed subquests, causing them to reload the previous save they made before the boss, but then they might forget that there wasn't a separate save station before the boss, but instead an elevator that went back and forth, meaning they'd foolishly think the game must have auto-saved after completing the previously mentioned section, causing them to take the need to the long elevator right out of this godforsaken volcano and back to the surface, only find out the route that they would have opened if the game could save at the point they assumed it was is closed of course so they go through the entire level again instead of taking the elevator just to get where they might angrily think to themselves they should have been in the first place then they need to defeat the boss again actually trigger that stupid floating monkey take the long way through the section again and finally be where they should have been 
an hour ago. Who <laughs> would be dumb enough to do that? Listen, can you stop? Thank you. Okay, click the- Are you f-